When I did my last video about Google's Go language, the question I got asked most was, why should you learn Go? Maybe you want to learn a new language. You know, there's Python, Rust, C, C++, C Sharp, whatever. Why should you invest your time learning Go? That's what I want to explain in this video. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So of course, Go, like lots of other languages, has got all of its kind of nice little features. Oh, that's nice. Oh, you don't need semicolons. Oh, that's good. You know, all the little things you might look at it and say, oh, that I like that. But there's one big fundamental reason why you should learn Go. It's not because it's from Google. It's not because it's open source. It's not because it's being used on, you know, on lots and lots of websites and servers around the world. The one reason is because of the Go routines. Go routines are the building block of Go and they are so, so useful. Now, hopefully you've had a chance to see my videos here on this channel about how you can use, you know, fork and P threads, kind of an introduction to multi-processing and multitasking. I also have another video here on the channel, which I really hope you've watched, which explains the difference between multi-threading, multitasking, multi-processing, really good background for understanding these terms. I also have a video talking about how you can use two cores in Arduino for running two programs separately on a microcontroller in concurrently so that you can kind of get things going on, one doing the networking, another one doing something else, running the UI, whatever. So I've got several different videos here talking about the idea of concurrency and parallelism. Now, in most languages, if you want to use kind of threading, there's this kind of big threading API, you know, the POSIX pthread API, Java's got its own thing. You know, you can do kind of things at an operating system level, let's say with Windows or whatever. But the thing about Go is it's got this idea of concurrency built right into the language. And you can just say, turn that into a parallel function, run it now concurrently, off you go, just go and do it. And the, the language worries about all the stuff that needs to happen to get that to run on the OS that you've compiled for. And it's got a whole load of structures for how you can communicate with those routines uh, and for synchronization and so on, so on. So what I want to do now is it's going to go straight over to uh, the code. We're going to write some code. We're going to see it running. And we're going to look at the idea of a Go routine, which is a lightweight thread that can run in the background. Just go do that. How you can talk to those background threads, uh, how you can get results back from them. And really that is the key feature of why Go is so good. Because if you're doing any kind of server stuff, anything that's running, databases, email, you know, MQTT, network stuff, whatever it is, then being able to scale up to huge numbers of kind of, you know, these Go routines is an absolutely brilliant thing. Okay, let's dive straight into some code. Okay, so here we have a very simple Go program. It's got one function called say. What does it do? Well, there's a loop here, zero to less than five. So five iterations. It will sleep for 100 milliseconds, and then it will print out whatever string has been passed in up here. So basically, it will print out five times whatever string you pass in slowly. And then in the main functions, we say, say hello, and say world. So we're gonna get five lots of hello coming out slowly, and then five lots of the word world coming out slowly. Okay, let's run it and see that that's what happens. So go run say.go, and what do we get? Hello, 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 quite slowly, world, 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 quite slowly. So that's exactly what we expected. Now, of course, this whole video is about how you can do Go routines, which are basically a way of adding parallelism and concurrency to your A program just by using the inbuilt constructs of Go. And it's really easy. All you do is put the word Go in front of the function that you want to call, and it will create a very lightweight thread, and it will go ahead and start running that function separately from the main thread. So what we're gonna see now, if we've done go hello, that will start running in the background, printing out hello slowly, but it will then jump straight to the next function, which is to say world, and that will start coming out. So if things are right, the one in the background will just kind of pop out the word hello at the same time as the one saying world is popping out hello. So you should get a mixture of hello uh, and world. So let's just run that and see what happens. And here we go. So what do we get? World, hello, hello, world, world, hello, hello, world, world. So there you go, a mixture of hello and world. Why? Because the one that we call go in front of it, the one that we call go in front of it is running in the background. It runs on its own little thread and starts pumping out those little, uh, those little words hello on its own little schedule, according of course to the schedule of the, of the operating system, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, whatever. 
Okay, let's move on to another example. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in this uh, little example is a thing called channels. Now that you've got this little function that can run on its own, wouldn't it be great if you could send and receive data from it? Because if you think about this, we're, we're trying to build up applications that can do many, many things simultaneously and you want to communicate between them. So what we've got here is a function called sum. And as you can guess here, sum at the very end does an x plus y. So it adds up uh, two numbers. Now, the way it's going to add up those two numbers, it's going to receive them via a thing called a channel. And so this here says I want to define a, the local variable we call the parameters. Again, the local variable called c is a channel of integers. So there are integers coming down this channel. And what it says here is that the value of y is going to be whatever comes down the channel. And you've got this new syntax here, this arrow, uh, uh, you know, this arrow pointing to the left, which is really just a left hand sign and a minus sign. So it come, you know, fill up x, the data travels in the direction of the arrow. So it goes from this channel into x. And then the next thing that comes down the channel going from right to left, I want to go into y. And then actually I want the result of x plus y to go back down the same channel. So channels cut work in both directions. So you can receive things from them and you can send things down them. Now, how do you, in the main program here, how do you make the channel? Well, you use the uh, make uh, keyword and you say it's a channel. You can also make slices and maps if you dig a bit deeper into the Go uh, language. And as we said earlier, it's an integer channel. And then we fire off this little uh, program to run in the background. Now, the thing about channels is they are blocking, which means it, when you say here, X is going to be filled with what comes down the channel. If there's nothing coming down the channel, then it just blocks and it just waits. So what's going to happen here is this little program is going to start, this little function will start running in the background. Then it's going to wait here until it gets something down the channel. Then it will wait here till it gets something down the channel. And then finally, it will send back down the channel the, the sum. So what do we do? We say call it and then we say, well, pump down that channel 10, then pump down the channel 15. So 10 will go into X, 15 will go into Y, it will add them together. And then we say, well, now I want our result to be whatever comes back down the channel. So that's what this is here coming down the channel. And then we want to print it out. So we should, if everything goes right, get 25. Well, let's run it and see what happens. So go run chan sum dot go 25 so that's exactly what we expected to happen and it worked perfectly however there is a, something we need to watch about these channels just to really understand what's going on when you create the channel this is the same program here but when you create the channel you can say that the channel has a certain length now the default length is just one which means when you send down a number it reads it into X and it blocks until there's something else that comes down it. Now, if you say that that channel is length two, then actually now what's gonna happen is 10 and 15 can go into the channel at the same time. And then we read back here. Now, the, tr the tricky thing here, when you read back here, is it gonna be reading the result or if it's running fast enough, a race condition, it might read 10 or it might read 15, depending on when it actually gets around to checking what's in the channel. So if this line here runs before either of these two lines, because there's no way to say you can, re you can read from the channel that you wrote, you can read from the channel you wrote to, you don't have to say it has to be another program. So in fact, if we run this, you'll find out it doesn't work. So let, let's run it and see. Go run channel sample two, 10. Well, that's not the right answer, is it? 10 plus 15 is not uh, 10. So, of course, what's happened is, is that it's put 10 down the channel. It's put 15 down the channel. And then before this function's actually had a chance to actually read them out here, we've read the result back out again. So the first thing that was in the channel was, in fact, uh, 10. So it didn't work. So that's a, uh, that doesn't actually solve our problem here. So if these two things are, aren't synchronized, then we're going to get some kind of problem. Now, there are different ways of solving this problem. The way I've chosen to do it, if we look at my next example, is to use an input channel and an output channel. So let's have a look again at our sum function here. This one now is going to go around forever. So it doesn't just exit in these other ones. It just exited after it done its bit of math. Here we're going to sit here as a worker thread. I'm going to sit here and every time I get something on the channel, I'm going to do something with it. And I'm just going to keep running around here, uh, eating up the data, taking in the data. And then once it's all processed, I, you know, I'll just sit here and wait for, for more. 
And then what we've got here now, if you notice, we've got uh, an input channel and an output channel, C and CO, C for CO for output, okay? And here I make two channels. One's got six buffer space in it and one's got three. Why? Well, there are two numbers get added up and there's one result. So if I can send in six numbers, I'll get back three results. And then I fire off my little function here, which is gonna go around in a loop, uh, taking in these numbers and then printing it and then getting the results. And so I, I squirt into my input queue all these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Okay, and then on the output queue, I basically know there's gonna be three. It's all obviously hard coded, you understand that. But this just demonstrates how it works. Uh, so I'm gonna print out the first result, print out the second result, and this is coming out of CO, the output queue. So if we do this, we should get 25, 130, the sum of these two numbers, the sum of these two numbers, the sum of these two numbers. And because we're using a different queue for the input, a different queue for the output, different channel, as they're called in uh, uh, Go, then I'm able to synchronize the input and the output. One other thing before we run it is that here, you I actually print out uh, just tell, showing that there's actually the sum being happening, and we can also see when it happens in the sequence of things. Okay, let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. Okay, go run. There's our program. So what's happened? We can see that the sum in the background is actually running and it's printing out these three sums as it eats them off the queue. And then after that's happened, the program schedules and actually we read off the, the results from the CO channel. So here's this section here reading off the results. So these got fed in pretty quick and they started getting uh, processed by this. And then once the results started coming out, we started reading them uh, here. Before we move on to the next example, I do want to remind you, you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains. And I also have a monthly newsletter. Go to GaryExplains.com. Type email address, no spam, but you will get the newsletter. Okay, now I've got one final example here, which is a bit more complicated, and hopefully we'll kind of tie together all of these ideas, uh, showing that we can have some Go functions that are kind of workers that just run in these lightweight threads that come with Go, and we feed them information, and then they do something. And we can see how the scheduler picks the next worker thread that is available so that it can actually do the work. So what we're doing here, we're gonna deal with some prime numbers. So the first thing is we're gonna send down our channel, no longer just an integer, we're actually gonna send a little structure here, it's all part of the Go language, that gives you a number, that uh, we want to test and a result, is it a prime or not? So we can send them in and then we can have the results back telling us whether it's prime or not. We're gonna do it 100 times, that's what this one here. And how many workers are we gonna have? Well, we're gonna have three of them and we'll show you what that means in a minute. Okay, so here is our function, is prime. It's basically a trial by uh, division. So it just basically divides up to the square root of the number to see whether it's a prime, not necessarily the most efficient way of doing it, but good as a proof of concept for us. So we have an input channel and an output channel. The primes that we wanna test will come in here, the results will come out here. Now, in each one, I'm gonna pick a random number between one and a million, just so that we can get each time this function is uh, actually running in its own lightweight thread to print out an ID so we can kind of recognize the different threads that are working. This is just for us to understand that the, the, that the different Go calls are creating different threads with this same function. It You wouldn't do this in a production system. This is just good for us to understand. And all this code does here is really just try to divide by every number and see whether it can be divided or not, which means it's prime or not. And basically, we set the false flag or the true flag depending on whether it's prime or not. So a very simple uh, prime testing program, as I said, not necessarily the most efficient. So down here in the main program, what do we do? Well, we create a dummy message because we're going to be sending those uh, back and forth. Okay. And so first of all, we need to create the channel. So there's our two channels and we're going to make sure they have a buffer length so that all the numbers can go into it. Again, you might not necessarily want to do this if you're dealing with millions and millions of internet connections, database records, you know, uh, MQTT uh, messages, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is you're writing your program, then you might not necessarily want to do this. Well, if you wouldn't want to do this, uh, you want some kind of dip buffering that allows you to have some in memory, but you don't want obviously all a million connections in memory uh, at once, but we're only dealing with a hundred here, so that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so the next thing to do is to create the workers. These will run in these lightweight threads that are created using the Go keyword, and it's a for loop. It's gonna go around num workers time, or what's that, three times, and it's gonna call this uh, is prime function as a concurrent routine, as a go routine. 
and they'll be sitting there with the input channel and the output channel so that we can send and receive data from them. The next thing we do is fill in that input queue. So this goes round test len time. I pick a random number between 1 million and 2 million and I just send that down the channel. So now we're filling up this channel and this channel is going to start to be read by the uh, by the is prime function reading them off those channels. And once we filled it up, we do exactly the same things we did in our previous example. We sit here and start to read out the results. So we're coming through the output channel now and we just print out that this number is either true or false depending on, on what's happened. These are all just random numbers so some are going to be and some are not going to be. Okay, so we fill up this queue with 100 numbers between a million and two million. The three versions of the is prime function are running and they're going to start taking things off those channels and then putting out their results on the channels. Okay, let's, let's run it and see how that actually works. So we want go run channel prime. Now lots of output here. Let's go back up to the top and see what happened from the very start. Okay, so first of all, this number here is that random number that identifies each of the threads. So we're expecting three random numbers here. And these are the numbers it's testing. So there's a whole, this one of them is getting a whole bunch of work here. Look, it's doing all that work uh, and no one is, is contesting it. No one is, is, is having a problem. So you, you go ahead and do that. But then suddenly, once it's working on that one, then a different uh, is prime function, a different go routine starts running. And we can see that runs down there near for what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine items it takes off the channel queue. And then the, uh, the first one kicks back in again with that same number. And it does quite a whole bunch load of them. So it's not having a problem doing that. And then just at the end here, we can see that the other one, so two of the queues have bit, two of the is prime uh, functions have been running there and then we start to get some of the results coming out so true and false just depending on what they are and then right here at the bottom we get a third one look at this that third go routine it gets a chance to test this last number and the last thing that comes off our queue is that that's false and if we look for this one 1979947 that will be the last one that we see tested up here there it is 1979 and that was tested by our second uh, go routine. The last one that the primary go routine tested was 1161598, which I think we'll find right down here at the bottom line. 1161598 is false. So there you go. Three different go routines and they were each taking data off those channels. So here is a really, really easy way to get concurrency in your programs. And this is why you should learn the go language. Okay, that's it, the Go routine, that the major big feature of why you should learn the Go programming language. Do tell me in the comments below if you agree with me, is that the killer feature of the Go language? Also, please let me know in the comments below if you would like to see more videos on Go. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.